Buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches a todos los amigos de Madrid Singularity. Hoy estamos comenzando las actividades del año y les deseamos un feliz año nuevo 2023 y feliz año nuevo chino, año lunar del conejo de agua. Así que comenzamos con una presentación magistral de Aubrey de Grey. So let me switch into English. Uh, because Aubrey de Grey is English, so he will be speaking in English for all of us, uh, members of Madrid Singularity. Actually, I'm very happy to tell you that uh, Madrid Singularity right now is the second largest group about the future in the meetups. And we are only second to London Futurist that is led by my co-author, David Good. So we have almost 3,000 members from Spain and from all over Latin America, as I like to say, from Madrid to Mexico and from Miami to Montevideo. We cover all the Spanish speaking world, over half a billion people. And we are proud to be the second largest language as a mother tongue, only after Chinese, because we have more people who are born to speak in Spanish than speak in English. And to begin with Madrid Singularity, we have this fantastic presentation with Aubrey de Grey that we will be translated into Spanish here in the Zoom channel and broadcast live uh, in YouTube. So besides this conference, we will have another one on uh, February 12th about cryopreservation. And we have representatives of um, Alcor, which is the largest and most traditional cryonics facility in the USA. And then the new facilities in Switzerland, um, tomorrow biostasis, and in Australia, Southern cryonics. And then in March, we will come back with another conference about anti-aging fully in Spanish with the leaders of the anti-aging movement, medical anti-aging in Spain, and in Latin America. But now let's introduce our uh, fantastic speaker, Aubrey de Grey. Uh, I actually met Aubrey de Grey exactly 20 years ago at Yale University in the year 2003. And I had read a lot about him before, but only physically I met him in 2003 at Yale University. He was already working on anti-aging he got his PhD from Cambridge University based on his previous book, which was the mitochondrial um, theory of aging and talking about oxidation and free radicals. And um, Aubrey before he studied also at Cambridge, he got his bachelor's of arts in computer science. And he worked a long time uh, in computer science, artificial intelligence, until he realized that the biggest problem of humanity is aging. All of us are aging and all of us are dying until now. So he began to write a fantastic book called Ended Aging that was published in English in the year 2007. And then later it was published in Spanish, as you can see on the right, El Fin del Envejecimiento, a fantastic book that I recommend to everybody. And it is in many other languages. It is in Italian, it is in German, it is in many other languages. Also, he inspired me to write my bestseller book, uh, La Muerte de la Muerte, The Death of Death, with my fantastic British co-author, David Good. And the prologue is by Aubrey de Grey. This book is a bestseller in many languages. And finally, it will come out in English, published by Springer Nature, Springer Fairlack, Springer Nature, uh, this summer in English as well. And also it will be coming out in uh, Japanese, Korean, and many other languages. So I'm really excited. And the inspiration is um, due also to Aubrey de Grey, that I repeat, wrote the prologue. So I have admired Aubrey de Grey for a long time. And he was very popular also at my alma mater, MIT. He was so popular at MIT Technology Review, the, the magazine of MIT, that he appeared on the cover of the magazine in the year 2005. But basically, they were 
making fun in a way of Aubrey de Grey, or he can talk more about that later if he wants, um, that his ideas were not really possible. But I am so happy that in 2019, the same publication from MIT, Technology Review, basically gave the reason to Aubrey, saying that old age is over if you want it. So I am really proud that uh, MIT changed its mind and that Aubrey is winning the battle of ideas and then of anti-aging itself. So um, German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer has this fantastic phrase, all truth passes through three stages. First stage, it is ridicule. And Aubrey was ridiculed for a long time and other people working on these ideas as well. Second stage, it is violently opposed. And Aubrey has sadly experienced that opposition himself personally. But finally, we are looking into the third stage that it will be accepted as self-evident. And we are getting close to that point. So with that, let me uh, give the word to Aubrey de Grey so that he can begin with his presentation uh, that he will do from his own um, computer, his own laptop, and talk about um, his new foundation and how he sees the field evolving. So, Aubrey, thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you so much, Jose. That was an extremely kind and generous introduction. And uh, yes, I apologize to everybody. I do not speak Spanish, so I will be giving this presentation in English. And I would like to very strongly thank Nicholas Chanowski, who will do simultaneous translation into Spanish. Uh, he is a great supporter of the Longevity Crusade, and I am very grateful to him for doing this for us today. So I am going to speak for maybe half an hour um, uh, before I answer any questions that the audience may have. And I'm going to be talking about the initial activities of the new organization that I set up just a few months ago, LEV Foundation, Longevity Escape Velocity Foundation. I am the President and Chief Science Officer, and I have a fantastic team, and I shall talk about that in a moment. Um, so, um, I'm having trouble uh, at my end. There we go. Good. Um, so, first of all, let me just introduce the concept of aging and how to address it with medicine. This is something that many of you in the audience may already have seen before because I have been using this simple diagram for many, many years. But some of you may be new to this, so I want to start here. Aging is the combination of two processes which are shown at the bottom of this little diagram. The first process, which goes on throughout life, even starting before we are born, is a process where the body damages itself. The body creates changes to the molecular and cellular structure of the body as consequences of the normal functioning of the body. Metabolism is the word that biologists use to describe all of the things that the body does to keep us alive from one day to the next. So these changes occur and accumulate throughout life. And the reason why it is appropriate to use the word damage to describe these changes is because the body is set up to tolerate only a certain amount of those changes. Eventually, late in life, there is more damage than what the body is set up to tolerate, and the result is that we start to get sick. That is the second process that's part of aging, the one that I describe here as happening in late life, that the damage causes the many pathologies of late life. So the purpose of this diagram is to describe, just in one word, the three approaches that we might, in principle, take to 
prevent the pathologies of late life. What that means is to separate metabolism from pathology, to allow us to carry on being alive without getting sick. Now, in principle, we could separate metabolism from pathology by separating damage from pathology. In other words, we could make the body capable of sustaining more damage without getting sick. But, of course, we could only do that to a limited degree. The more damage you have, the more difficult it is to keep you healthy. And that is why the right-hand alternative, geriatrics, has not worked. Why we have failed to eliminate the health problems of late life over the many decades where we have been trying to apply medicine in that way. About a hundred years ago, a few people began to realize that geriatric medicine was never going to work against the health problems of late life. And that is where the field of gerontology came from. People started to say, well, let us be more preventative. We want to separate metabolism from pathology. Instead of trying to separate damage from pathology, let us separate metabolism from damage. In other words, let us make the body run more cleanly and so that it does not create so much damage as a consequence of being alive as it normally would. And that was a very um, original idea, but that has also been completely unsuccessful. We have failed to do this. Ultimately, the reason why it has been unsuccessful is because th the process of creating damage is just too linked, too closely linked to the processes that we need metabolism to do to keep us alive. So, again, it's a non-starter. But 20 or more years ago, I started to talk... I, I can hear people speaking in Spanish. Uh, okay, that's over. Um, 20 or so years ago, I started to promote the idea of a completely different, third way to separate metabolism from pathology. And that is to repair the damage, to eliminate parts of the damage that metabolism creates every so often, so that the total amount of damage in the body never reaches this amount that causes us to get sick. And that turns out to be a really practical option, which has now become a very mainstream idea. It took maybe 10 years for people in the field to really understand what the maintenance approach really is, but now they really get it. And I'm having trouble changing, there we go. Um, so the reason why the maintenance approach is practical was first set out in a paper that I published 21 years ago now, along with some very distinguished co-authors. And in that paper, I described a very manageable number of categories of damage, which I'm listing here on the left-hand side. Actually, in that very first paper, there were nine categories, but quickly it became seven. Um, now, these categories are very broad. For example, the first one says cell loss. That means just cells dying and not being automatically replaced by the division of other cells. That is something that causes certain of the main pathologies of late life, such as Parkinson's disease and also the decline in function of the immune system. And the generic way to fix it is stem cell therapy. We put cells into the body that can divide and replace the cells that the body is not replacing automatically. But of course, different stem cell therapies for different organs and tissues have some differences. Nevertheless, all stem cell therapies also have a lot in common, so that makes sense as a category. And if you go down this list, we can say the same thing for each of the categories, that the 
category corresponds to a generic approach to repairing the damage, to eliminating the damage. And this has been very successful over the past 20 years. All seven of these categories of damage repair have made great progress. Some of them are further along in the medical research path than others, of course, but we are definitely getting there. So, why am I calling my new foundation the Longevity Escape Velocity Foundation? Well, that's because of another concept that I introduced about 20 years ago, which is that rejuvenation, damage repair, buys time. If you are 60 years old and we have some damage repair therapies which can repair most of the damage in your body that has resulted from aging, but not all of it, then maybe we can give you 20 years of extra life. If we can do that, then great, that extra life will be healthy extra life. We will be keeping you biologically younger than 60 for 20 years. But by the time you are 60, the, dam the types of damage that the body, that the therapies do not repair will be enough on their own to make you biologically 60 again. And of course, those difficult types of damage will continue to accumulate and eventually we will, you will get sick. The thing is though, it, during those 20 years before you became biologically 60 again, we will, we, the scientists like myself, will have improved the therapies so that they will be more comprehensive. They will be able to repair some of the difficult damage as well as the easy damage so that we will be able to re-rejuvenate the 80 year old who is 60 for the second time so that they don't become biologically 60 for the third time until they are 100 or more and so on. And what this means is that Eventually, we will reach a point at which scientists are postponing the health problems of late life faster than time is passing. So that people who are always getting the most modern damage repair therapies will never have enough damage in their body to make them sick as a result of how long ago they were born. And that is kind of similar to gravitational escape velocity, where if you are, for example, jumping off a cliff, like this guy in the diagram, and while you are falling towards the ground, you turn on a jetpack that makes you go upwards. Of course, if you are already going downwards rapidly, the jetpack will not have time to stop you from hitting the ground. But if you are still high enough above the ground, the jetpack will stop you from falling before you hit the ground and you will start to go up. So that's what this diagram tries to show. <coughs> so, who are Longevity Escape Velocity Foundation? Well, I am very proud and happy that I have brought in the four people you see here as my core team, Caitlin Lewis and Max Pito, and Ben Zeely all used to work for Sense Research Foundation in one capacity or another. And they are helping me to do, to work out what science to do to make sure that we save as many lives as possible, as quickly as possible. And Hannah Friedenberg is our chief of staff. She mainly works for my executive chair, Greg Grinberg, who you see here on the top left. Greg is the chair of our board of directors. And he, along with the other five directors here, are the perfect team to have in charge of the governance of a nonprofit. They are deeply committed to the longevity mission. They have 
all of the various many areas of expertise that you need on a board of directors and above all they have a very deep and uh, confirmed track record of commitment to respect the intent of donors to spend donors money in the way that donors want it. You can see that David Wood is one of those directors. Uh, David of course was mentioned earlier by Jose because he and Jose wrote a book that has now come out in many languages. Um, so this is the team and I'm now going to talk a little bit about the activities of the Foundation. First of all, we are doing conferences. Some of you will know that for the past 20 years I have run a series of conferences, first in Cambridge, then in Berlin, and now in Dublin, in Ireland. These conferences are enormously important uh, as aspects of my work in building and maintaining this community of longevity crusaders. And the first conference in Dublin happened last September. It was massively successful. You can see here the team, first of all, on the right hand side, most of the directors of LEV Foundation and on the left hand side, most of the staff and also the um, leaders of the, the projects that we are funding. And uh, as you can see here, we are already planning, in fact, we have already planned the 2023 conference in Dublin. You can see the dates there. So I hope that all of you will try to come to this conference. The roster of speakers will be even more impressive than it was in 2022. And the website will be updated, I think, today or tomorrow. All right, so what else are we doing? Well, we are doing a lot more than I used to do on advocacy and education. We seed funded a series of retreats that are being run under the name Less Death, which are designed to bring in new talent into the field. People who may be entrepreneurs or journalists or in some other way um, have skills that we need in the longevity movement and who want to take part, but who have not really understood how they can contribute most effectively. Less Death is designed to help that. And the first Less Death uh, retreat, which happened last year, was a massive success. The second one happened just last week, and there will be three more this year. Similarly, we are helping to kickstart a longevity movement in Africa, which is led by two wonderful people, one from South Africa, one from Nigeria. Again, they are running annual conferences, among other things. So please look up Afro Longevity. And then in terms of policy, especially in the US, we are interested in educating policymakers and elected representatives. That is the job of the Alliance for Longevity Initiatives, A4LI, which we are funding. And Finally, we have the Healthspan Action Coalition, which is a patient advocacy group that is bringing together many, many constituencies to, to represent the older generation in a way that gives the older generation hope for the eventual medical control of aging, rather than just fatalistic um, uh, managing of the process of becoming sicker and sicker. So, now I want to talk for the rest of the talk about our research focus. And I don't have time to talk about our cryonics work, which is kinase, uh, but I have spoken about that elsewhere and I will do so again. Uh, just very briefly, it is a company taking forward the most exciting and promising cryonics um, research that I know of, which is to use uh, a technology called persiflation. Secondly, we are looking at the um, improvement of organ transplantation by developing perfusates, 
uh, material that can be pumped through the vasculature of an organ before it is transplanted so as to rejuvenate it better than can be done if the organ is in the body. But for the rest of the talk, I just wanted to, to discuss the first thing on this slide, which is the work on combining late onset rejuvenation interventions in mice. We believe that this is the single most important work that is not being done well by other groups around the world. It's very expensive and very ambitious, but well, that's what I do. I, do, I, I don't do timid stuff. So what are we doing? We are combining four very different interventions. You can see them listed here. Rapamycin, hematopoietic stem cells, that's blood stem cells, telomerase gene therapy, and also a senolytic called galactose conjugated noviticlax. You don't have to remember that. Um, we will be starting to treat these mice when they are already a year and a half old. That means that they have about one year to live on average. And we want to extend their lives by an additional year. We will be measuring many things in addition to how long they live. All experiments that are worth doing in longevity uh, do that. And I will talk now a little bit about what we're doing. First of all, these are the groups of mice that we are looking at. And of course, the goal here is to understand how these various damage repair interventions interact and how they can be used together to get more impact. So group number 10 at the bottom left is all four interventions combined. But of course, we also need to know how we, we need to have a baseline. So that means we have to have a group of mice that don't get the interventions. That's group one at the top. And we also have to have four groups which just get one of the interventions so that we can quantify the individual impact of each one. And finally, groups six, seven, eight and nine are there because we need to show whether some pairs of interactions, combinations might actually be antagonistic. In other words, they might actually cancel each other out. So we need to find that out. We will also be doing something rather clever with the control animals, the ones that do not get the therapies. We will have two different types of control, and this is so as to understand the impact of the delivery mechanism. Sometimes animals do not like getting injected, or they don't like the taste of the food they're getting, for example. So we will need to um, control for that. Then what will we be measuring? As I said, we will not only be measuring lifespan, we will also be measuring health span. We will be measuring how healthy these mice are um, in various ways. Some of those measurements will involve just looking at them to see, for example, whether they are losing fur, that's called alopecia, or whether their spine is becoming bent, that's called kyphosis. We will also be looking at their behavior. There are various ways to measure, for example, how good the memory of a mouse is. Then we will also be taking blood from the animals, just very small amounts, so as to measure things like uh, what's in the blood, whether that is changing and how rapidly it's changing during the mouse lifespan. And finally, we will also be measuring things that require us to kill the mice. Of course, if you kill the mice, then they are no longer part of the lifespan experiment. So we'll only be killing a quarter of the mice that we are using. But we will have more information as a result of that. Finally, we have a new innovation that I don't think people have ever used in lifespan experiments. <coughs> and I believe that this is a big improvement on previous work. Normally, if you want to do measurements of health span of the sort that I described in the previous slide, you measure, you decide on particular ages, chronological ages, at which you will measure these things. And that's not very smart, because if a therapy is working, 
then of course they, the, the mice that will be getting the therapy will be biologically younger at a given chronological age than, they, than the mice that are not getting the therapy. But you will know that anyway because the mice that are getting the therapy will live longer. So you are kind of not getting very much additional information if you measure two things that you already know are going to be closely correlated. So we are going to get more information because we are going to decide on the time points of, do of these tests for each group individually. And we will do so on the basis of how many of the mice are alive. So in each of the 10 groups, we will do our first tests after 10 of the 50 mice in each sex have died. And we will take four of the mice to, to kill and we will do all the other tests as well. Similarly, the second time point will be when eight more mice have died and so on. This will get a better signal to noise ratio than what you would get in a standard experiment of this sort. So that's all I'm going to say. I'm now going to uh, answer questions for as long as we like. Uh, but of course, I should emphasize that you can always go to our website, levf.org, to support us. We have, of course, a nice friendly donate page and also for updates on all of our work. So thank you very much and over to you. Well, thanks to you, Aubrey, for this uh, fantastic brief introduction to anti-aging and to your new foundation. I also want to thank uh, Nicolas doing the translation from Brazil, which I have followed also a bit and it sounds pretty good. And also to Tony Carbonero, who is uh, coordinating all the technical issues and the Zoom and the streaming on YouTube. By the way, uh, we have had uh, about a hundred people connecting, half of them in the Zoom and half in the streaming. Uh, and people send greetings from uh, Canada all the way to Argentina, passing by uh, Colombia, Peru, and uh, obviously here in Spain. And also, Gennady Storialov sent greetings from the USA, and he said that he's very proud to be one of the directors of the new foundation, Longevity Escape Velocity Foundation. So, Gennady, thank you. Thank you for following uh, what we are doing. So we have some questions, but uh, talking about foundations, Aubrey, I will ask the first question, and then we will take uh, people here in the Zoom for other questions. But um, we, you have founded already three foundations, the Methuselah Foundation, the SENSE Research Foundation, and now Longevity Escape Velocity Foundation. So could you tell us briefly what are the changes and what is the evolution of these foundations, please? Sure, certainly. So, yes, as you say, the first foundation <clears throat> that I created jointly with a wonderful businessman named Dave Goebel, who has continued to be a close friend of mine ever since, that was the Methuselah Foundation. And the Methuselah Foundation began when there was no money in this field at all. Nobody really had any interest or ambition in longevity research. And so we could not fund research. So the first thing that we did was to improve the profile, to raise the profile of longevity research by essentially just making it more interesting to the general public. And we did that by creating prizes. We created two prizes for the extension of mouse lifespan. And of course, these prizes were monetary and we didn't have any money. But that's why we created a charity so that people could donate and the money they donated would go into the prize pot. And that was very successful over the next few years from 2003 through to 2005 or six, And that is what allowed us to start doing research at the Methuselah Foundation. But eventually in 2009, we decided that actually 
it would be better to have two separate organizations, one for the PR and the promotional stuff like the prizes and another one for the research. So that's why we created Sense Research Foundation, um, which has been pursuing rejuvenation research, the development of these medicines to repair damage. Now, as Sense Research Foundation, again, we are a non-profit and the money to do this research comes from philanthropy, almost all of it, which means that there is an enormous amount of freedom to work on very difficult problems, problems that are neglected by industry and also by academia, in which for different reasons, there is a very strong pressure to work on the easiest problems. So Sense Research Foundation has done splendid work. I'm very proud of the work that was done there, is being done there. Uh, to take forward the early stage research to create these rejuvenation medicines. But one thing that Sense Research Foundation only slightly ever did and really has not done sufficiently and never will do sufficiently, I don't think, is the work that I talked about today, combining individual therapies to get the main result that we want to damage to repair damage comprehensively enough that we can actually extend healthy lifespan, first of all in mice and of course eventually in human beings. Also, Sense Research Foundation has not historically done any significant work in cryonics and that is another major interest of mine. Of course, it is designed to help and save the lives of people who are too old to have any chance of benefiting from the rejuvenation therapies that Sense Research Foundation is working on. So that is the main top level distinction between the three different foundations. Okay, uh, fantastic, Aubrey. Uh, we have many friends here, so let's hear from them. We have a friend from Italy, Andrea is in Italy. We have friends from Venezuela. Oscar, Christian, Vicente from Venezuela, from Spain, <coughs> Albert and um, uh, Pepe Serrano, for example. So who wants to be the first one to ask a, a question uh, in person? Just uh, raise your hand and Tony, let them in or uh, unmute them so that we can hear. Andrea, adelante. Hi, Rosa. Hi, Aubrey. Hi, everyone. Hello. Thank you for the interesting uh, topic. And uh, I want to ask uh, this uh, curiosity on uh, persuflating materials for organ trans transplanting. Uh, I want uh, to know more uh, information. Uh, uh, what okay. are these? Yeah. Thanks. So, um, at the moment, if you go to the LEV Foundation website and you look at our projects, there are just a couple of paragraphs about persiflation and about why it is such a promising technology. But let me just summarize. <coughs> the idea is that with persiflation, you will be able to cool a solid organ or of course a brain or the whole body much more rapidly than you can if you do it with surface cooling, uh, cooling from the outside of the body. And that's very important for reducing the amount of damage that is done by the cryopreservation process. Especially it is because you need less cryoprotectant in order to avoid uh, crystallization, which is of course the main thing that damages organs when they are frozen you need less cryoprotectant if you cool faster and the cryoprotectants are a little bit toxic so that's very beneficial. The second huge advantage of persiflation is that it does it, it prevents cracking, the fracturing of tissues as a result of thermal stress essentially because cracks do not propagate through through gas, through bubbles. 
So um, the main clever thing about persiflation that is new in this company, Kynice, and its predecessor, Aragos, is the is which gas you use to pump through the vasculature. In this case, they are using helium. And there are various reasons why helium is a good one to use. The main one is that it has very low solubility in water. So it does not mess up cells by making bubbles inside cells. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, do you want to continue, Andrea, or um, with that question? Are you happy? Yes, yes, I am. I, uh, after uh, I think about uh, this, <laughs> thank you. Okay, you. so uh, please feel free to ask in Spanish as well. That, somebody, uh, has, somebody has just asked a question in the chat. Um, um, chat. Yes. So you want to read that question, Aubrey? Yeah. Um, if uh, longevity or immortality is a main characteristic of cancer cells, do we risk to get a massive cancer condition when we approach immortality? Yes, that's a very good question. So some people prefer to consider cancer as separate from aging, but I don't do that. I, um, I regard cancer as part of aging because almost all cancers happen late in life. And indeed, if you look at the list of seven categories of damage in aging that I have been using for so many years, one of them is what I call division obsessed cells, which means cells that are dividing when they are not supposed to. And of course, that is the um, main definition of cancer. So we are very, very much focused on eliminating cancer. But your question is quite correct. On the one hand, if we are too, um, too aggressive in uh, introducing stem cells or other rege regenerative, rejuvenative mechanisms, we, and we don't do anything about cancer, then there is definitely a risk that we will get more cancer than we had before. Um, and I think that this is the main challenge which faces people who are working on the concept of partial reprogramming, which is something that was pioneered, in fact, by Spanish and Latin American uh, researchers over the past decade. I do, not, I do not know how that will work out, but that is a big challenge for people working in that area. However, we can also describe the interaction between cancer and regeneration the other way around. We can say that if we are successful in developing therapies that really, really cure cancer, that bring cancer under complete control, then we will be able to be more aggressive with regeneration than we otherwise could. It will make the rest of our job easier. And I think that there is a genuine chance that we may be able to do that. Okay, I'm going to keep reading. Um, Joey uh, Koningsbruggen says, is there a reason not to use partial reprogramming? I gather that could be done. Right. And uh, Joey, first of all, let me thank you very deeply for the donation that I just saw came in uh, to LEV Foundation that you just made. Thank you very much for that. Um, so actually, coincidentally, I just answered the partial reprogramming question in part, but let me answer it some more. As I said, the uh, concept here, which for those of you who don't know, is to drive backwards the developmental clock in cells in the body using what are called the Yamanaka factors, proteins that were discovered in uh, Japan 15 or more years ago. Um, the, the idea here is to make cells in the body more stem-like more regenerative. And uh, definitely, we need to do much more work in this area. I have explained that the main concern is to is that it may make more cancer. And we, we just don't know the answer to that yet. But it may not, we may be able to avoid that. And in particular, I am very interested in the possibility that other factors, other different ones than the Yamanaka factors, 
may also achieve the same regenerative um, impact, the regenerative therapy, without having nearly so much risk of cancer. So there's masses to do in this area. Um, let me see what else I can see here. Uh, that's, uh, that's from Joey. Um, Before Joey's question, there are two other questions from Jorge Carvalho. Yes, I've spotted one now. What mouse strains are you going to use in your experiments? Excellent question. So we are very much using strains that already live a long time normally. If you use a strain that is short lived, then that strain has something genetically wrong with it. And you do not know whether that um, whether the therapies that work on short lived mice will also work on long lived mice. So we have to use long lived mice. Now, in the experiment that I described in this talk, which we are starting right now, um, we will use the strain that is used most often in lifespan experiments around the world, which is called C57 Black 6. And um, we are you know, using that strain because we were able to buy mice of that strain that are already old, that are already 18 months old. Um, however, there are some shortcomings of that strain and the result is that some researchers over the past 10 or 15 years have been using a different strain called HET3, H-E-T-3. And uh, we are probably going to switch to that strain for our next version of this experiment that we hope to begin later this year. <clears throat> we can't use that strain yet because simply we cannot, it's not possible to buy old HET3 mice yet, but by the later this year that will be possible and we will probably switch to it. Uh, then the second question, how could CRISPR-Cas9 techniques help? <coughs> so CRISPR-Cas9 is an enormously valuable uh, tool in the whole of medical research, not just in aging. We can make changes to the genome in cell culture and increasingly also using gene therapy um, in, in other words, in living organisms, living animals, using this technique. And so there is nothing particularly special about longevity research in terms of the applicability of CRISPR-Cas9, but it is absolutely an enormously valuable tool across the whole of medicine. Uh, let me ask you uh, questions in Spanish. Uh, I will translate. For example, Carlos Espinosa is asking, uh, do you like the fasting therapies in order to eliminate zombie cells or senescent cells? So fasting therapies are not part of our initial experiment, but we do have rapamycin, which is the most powerful of the chemicals that are typically called calorie restriction mimetics. In other words, Drugs, <clears throat> drugs that make the body think that it is fasting, even when it isn't. We are introducing rapamycin as a kind of non-repair control intervention. We know that it works. Many, many researchers have shown that it works to extend average and maximum lifespan in mice. Um, and we want to know how it synergizes, how it interacts with actual damage repair therapies. So that's the main thing that we're doing in that whole area right now. <clears throat> uh, let me ask you uh, from the streaming, uh, a person called MB asked, well, first of all, thank you, Aubrey. Do you expect any of the rejuvenation techniques mentioned to be available to humans in your lifetime? I think it is very likely that all of the rejuvenation therapies that are being worked on right now will be available to the general public within the next 20 years. I think that there is a probably 50% chance that they will be available, at least to some people, within 15 years, because the research is moving so rapidly now. And that is the time frame where I think we may be able to reach this thing called longevity escape velocity. Of course, we need to do a lot of research between now and then. So there is a 10% chance at least that we will not get there for 100 years. But a 50% chance is quite enough to be worth fighting for. 
uh, there is a related question in Spanish from Mauricio Vladimir. Uh, Mauricio asks, uh, what is the life expectancy that you are targeting now, 150, 200 years, since there are already a lot of people, especially in Japan, who live over 110 years of age? Well, actually, there aren't all that many who live to 110. In fact, there aren't all that many who live to 100. Um, but no, I do not think about lifespans at all. Not, e not even slightly. I am all about the humanitarian impact of this work. I am interested in stopping people from getting sick because being sick is miserable. I do not like to see human beings suffer and I want to prevent them from the main cause of suffering that exists in the world today, which is being sick as a result of having been born a long time ago. So that's what I want to do. The longevity aspect of this is a side effect. It's a consequence of staying healthy. And I don't think about that very much. Okay, another question in Spanish from Carlos Fernandez. He basically asked, um, how long before we get these uh, therapies, uh, first for um, a, a slowing aging and second for rejuvenating people? So it's divided into extending uh, <coughs> lifespan and reversing aging itself. So, um, f first of all, as I mentioned a moment ago, it is impossible to give a confident answer for how long this is going to be. So the only answers that I can give are probabilistic. I can say that there is a 50% chance of getting there in 15 years, but a 10% chance of not getting there for 100 years. But to answer the rest of the question, it is very important to understand that we will not have this intermediate phase where we are slowing aging down but not reversing it. That's not going to happen. We will move directly from the time when we are in now, where we are basically not slowing aging down at all or hardly at all, into immediately a phase in which we are <clears throat> reversing aging, which we are genuinely rejuvenating people. There will not be some period in the middle where we are aging half as fast as we are now. That's not going to happen. Um, okay, I have several other questions that I can read, but I want to know if someone wants to ask a question in person. Anyone uh, raising their hand or wanting to ask the question or we keep on uh, through the written questions? Okay, if no volunteers, here I have a question from Esteban. He asks in English, I would like to know which biological clock would you choose if you had to choose just one clock to monitor aging? Yeah, so this is a great question. As we all know, there are many people now working on epigenetic clocks, ways to measure the methylation status of cells so as to uh, give a, an indication of biological age. And there are still many things that are not perfect about these clocks. People are trying to improve them all the time. People are also looking at other ways to use uh, what are called, what's called omics data uh, to look at, for example, proteins or transcripts to ask about the um, <clears throat> biological age of organisms. But again, those clocks have also a long way to go before they are really reliable. On top of all of that, of course, we already have many other ways to measure biological age, so you can call them clocks, which have to do with the more traditional approaches of measuring, <coughs> measuring things in the blood or measuring um, uh, function like grip strength or, or things like that. And as I mentioned earlier, we will be doing all of those things in our experiments that I described. But the omics work, because it is improving so much, <clears throat> we honestly do not have a decision as to how we will do this. We don't have to have that decision immediately because these measurements can be done on frozen tissue. So we will be able to do these experiments later once we have better information and better clocks. 
Okay, another question from the streaming. Um, one person called Raison Login. Um, the, the question is, um, what are the reanimation criteria that you gave Alcor? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I honestly don't remember. It was 20 years ago that I signed up with Alcor. Uh, however, one criterion that I think is quite important when one is choosing to be cryopreserved, to, to sign up to be cryopreserved, is that you don't want to be one of the first people who is reanimated because they just aren't going to know how well it's going to work. And that is actually one reason to sign up to be a neuro patient rather than a whole body patient, because we can be fairly confident that <clears throat> whole body patients will be revived first, simply because those, those patients do not need to have a new body constructed to attach their heads to. And um, so I am signed up as a neuro patient at the moment, and I believe that that is an insurance against being one of the people who are uh, revived first before people really know what they're doing. Okay, fantastic. Uh, we have a question from Gregory Hidalgo. You want to ask it uh, yourself, Gregory? Yes, thank you. Uh, greetings from El Salvador. A very Hello. interesting the lecture, Dr. De Grey. My question is related to, you say that in 15 years old, in 15 years time, sorry, it will be available the medication from preventing the anti-aging. So do you think that people that already have almost 80 years old in that time will be able to get it? It will be um, like, uh, for instance, a good timing for them or they should start taking before What will be the, the right. average so, age yeah, I when you start taking the medications? So, first of all, of course, the age at which these medications will be effective is the biological age, not the chronological age. So, okay. if you are an unusually young 80-year-old, you have a better chance than if you are an average 80-year-old, because an average 80-year-old is about to die, right? Um, so, that's the first thing to say. Second thing to say is that at the moment, these rejuvenation therapies simply don't do very much because they are so selective. They only address very small, minor parts of the damage that is accumulating in the body. And therefore, it is not clear whether they will have any real impact on delaying the health problems that might kill somebody. The best that one can do today, really, to, um, to, to, to look after oneself and to postpone the health problems of late life is traditional stuff, essentially just living the way your mother told you to. Don't smoke, you know, don't get seriously overweight, have a varied diet and keep yourself in as good condition as you can. Pay attention to your body, <clears throat> do as much exercise as you find that you need and so on. Um, I wish that there were there were more that we could already do, but there really isn't, and that's why it's so important also to think about um, about cryonics, about signing up to be cryopreserved if these therapies do not come along in time for you. Um, there are several other questions about anti-aging, but because we are on cryonics, uh, Joey Koenigsbruggen has a question about cryonics, and he's asking. Are there currently animals cryopreserved, non-human primates, in order to test feasibility of resurrection, say, 10 years down the line? <clears throat> so, so a number of the cryonics companies and providers do have the facility to preserve pets. And so there are quite a lot of cats and dogs, I know, that are cryopreserved already. However, when we talk about reviving animals, that has not yet been done. It's certainly something that would be a huge milestone for the <clears throat> feasibility and indeed the credibility of cryonics, and it's something that people want to do. But reviving a cryopreserved mouse is very, very nearly as difficult as reviving a cryopreserved human. So we still have some way to go before we can reach that point. 
Okay, let's go back to, to questions here in the Zoom. Amarildo asks, what does rejuvenation really mean? To extend life by uh, preventing serious illness or to actually reverse aging and function again as someone in their 20s or 30s? It absolutely means restoring function, restoring how you look, how you feel and how you function to how you were in early adulthood, in your 20s or 30s. Now, of course, really, um, that's not so much a contradiction. I'm not saying no to the first of the alternatives, because those alternatives that you gave in the question are not really alternatives. They are the same thing. A lot of the confusion about this arises from, from inaccuracy and imprecision about the definition of what the word aging means. The word aging means different things to different people. And that's a real problem. So I try not to use the word aging very much. I talk about the health problems of late life and so on. Um, so yes, that's really basically yes to both of your alternatives, but especially the second one. Okay, Bernardo asks, does rapamycin risk reducing the capabilities of the immune system? Right, so um, rapamycin was originally discovered and used medically because it does suppress some aspects of the immune system. Um, but this has been researched a lot over the past decade or more since it became apparent that rapamycin can extend the lifespan of mice. And there are, first of all, there are definitely only some aspects of the immune system which are affected. Secondly, um, there is a lot of work going on to develop drugs that are similar to rapamycin, but that do not even have that effect, that do not have any of the side effects that rapamycin was shown to have. So it's really not much of a problem. Okay, um, I believe Enrique Segarra from Spain asked, um, this is in Spanish, so I will translate. In Spain, we have elections at the three different levels, city, region, and country level this year. So elections everywhere. And he's asking, what can we do so that the politicians take uh, this seriously, anti-aging? What do we tell them to propose? Or what should they propose? How we can use politicians to advance our cause? So politicians are easy people to understand because we know what they want. They only want one thing. They want to get re-elected. So all you need to do in order to get a politician to support the policy that you want is to persuade the politician that there are votes in it, that it will be popular with the people who are going to decide whether that politician is elected or not. And that's why I spend so much of my time talking to the general public, educating them on the idea of medicine against the health problems of late life, medicine against aging. <clears throat> People often think that medicine against aging is impossible because aging is not a disease, they will say. It's like gravity. It's built into the fabric of the universe. But um, increasingly, people are understanding that that is not true. Now, therefore, one thing to um, to do is to do petitions or opinion polls or whatever to say, you know, would you like to stay healthy? Would you like to get Alzheimer's disease? Things like that. Um, and to show politicians the results of these polls. Of course, you have to ask the question in the right way. You should not never ask, how long do you want to live? Because the general public will interpret that question as how long do you want to live in an old state of health? which of course is not the right question at all. Um, <clears throat> another thing that should be borne in mind in Spain is that Spanish researchers have done a lot of the most important work in this area. Um, in fact, two Spanish researchers, Maria Blasco and Manuel Serrano, were responsible for the most pioneering work that has led to two of the four interventions that we are using in our mouse experiment. Uh, Ma uh, Maria 
showed that telomerase could extend lifespan in mice, and Manuel developed this thing called conjugated noviticlax, the phenolytic. So, um, you know, Spain is one of the leading countries in terms of the actual contribution that has already been made to the medical control of aging. And politicians like to be able to, you know, say things like that. So further promoting this work in Spain is actually going to be easier from a political perspective than it is in most countries. Excellent. We have a question from Christian Salas, who is a medical doctor in Venezuela. Actually, two uh, quick questions. He's asking about using exosomes from uh, stem cells from the umbilical cord as opposed to uh, exosomes from mesenchymal stem cells. Mm -hmm. uh, that's question number one. And question number two from the same medical doctor, he's asking which kind of senolytics would you recommend to use with a human patients now? Okay, let me answer the second question first because it is a much simpler question. At the moment, <clears throat> there is a real problem of reproducibility with the synolytics that are available, the ones that are from natural products or are already approved. It seems that these synolytics do not really have very, do not have enough selectivity to kill senescent cells. That is why in our, exper in our mass experiment, we are using this rather sophisticated chemical that we are having to get synthesized uh, um, you know, at our own expense. Um, it, is <clears throat> it, is, it is very promising. It looks much more selective than most of the things that have been used. And we also understand why it is selective because it is targeted to cells that have a particular enzyme that they make a lot of that senescent cells do. Um, but for things that are available already to the general public, I really don't think that we can make good recommendations. Plus also, of course, we must remember that I am a PhD, not an MD, so I am legally not allowed to make recommendations of that kind. <clears throat> okay, on the second question about exosomes from different types of stem cell, this is a very active research area. Honestly, it is impossible to say which exosomes are better. The general idea of using exosomes rather than using the, injecting the stem cells themselves is a brilliant thing. And uh, it may be a, the main way to avoid the immune reactions that come from using stem cells taken from a different person, what's called an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, so that's the big advantage. But what exosomes to use, or indeed whether to build exosomes that did not come from cells at all, but rather we just engineer what's inside them. You know, these are very, very early research areas that we just can't answer the question yet. <clears throat> okay, uh, another question from Javier Jimenez in Spanish. So I will translate. Um, what do you think about the therapies that Liz Parrish is taking and her uh, company, BioViva. So Liz is a wonderful member of this community, a great friend of mine. And she, as many of you will know, she was what she likes to call patient zero in um, getting gene therapy for telomerase and folistatin several years ago in Colombia. Um, all I know is she's doing very well for her age. Um, she is, she seems not to have had any side effects from this and she may very well have had benefits. But these are unapproved therapies in Western countries. So at the moment, there is no more that we can say. However, certainly the fact that she did these therapies on herself was the main thing that allowed her to become such a powerful advocate in this space and she is an amazing advocate in this space. So she has made a huge contribution to the field just in advocacy as a result of having become high profile through these therapies that she did on herself. Okay, excellent. Let me take one more question from the YouTube channel and then Andrea who is raising his hand. Okay, uh, Chi Chan asked, uh, two years ago, you said that LEV was 15 years away. 
but according to your recent talks, it is still 15 years away. When will we get that down to 10 years away? Are there any key technologies missing? So, of course, my estimates of how long away, how far away these therapies are, are very approximate. So I'm, I, I think I, I, I probably think we are only 13 years away now, but I'm not really sure. You know, it's very approximate. Uh, again, this is all probabilistic. This is with 50% probability. Um, however, what I can say, if we look at the past, the past 20 years, is it's looking good now. Um, over those 20 years, I have been making predictions of the same sort. And 20 years ago, I said that we were probably 25 years away from longevity escape velocity, uh, with again, 50% probability. Um, now, that means that we have only gone half as fast as I predicted. So that sounds bad. But it doesn't sound nearly so bad if we ask what I was saying 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I was still saying 20 to 25 years. I felt that we had made hardly any progress. Whereas in the most in the second 10 years, the past 10 years, we have hardly slipped at all. The, the my predictions have been going down by about one year per year. So I believe that we have a good chance that my predictions will continue to come down by one year per year. I do not believe that there are any huge showstoppers now. 10 years ago, there were two, at least, of the seven categories of damage and categories of damage repair had made essentially no progress in the previous 10 years since I started talking about them. And now both of those two, mitochondrial mutations and stiffening of the extracellular matrix, have both moved forward quite a lot, both in the work that we have done at Sense Research Foundation and now also in startup companies. So yeah, things are moving pretty well. Uh, okay, Andrea, you can ask your question live. Yes, I repeat the question. Uh, before you mentioned that uh, slow aging and reverse regeneration about aging will happen at, so, at the same time in the future, in the sense not a period in the middle, you said. Uh, this is due uh, to the fact of the exponential growth technology and what we already did uh, today, or no. for other reasons that you no, it's nothing to do with exponential change or accelerating change or anything to do with you know, the way that people talk about the technological singularity. Okay. It's purely because the therapies that are going to achieve this um, longevity escape velocity will be rejuvenation therapies. So it's simply a question of how much time they buy. If you have therapies that are comprehensive enough, then you will bi age backwards, you will become biologically younger as time goes past. If the therapies are not comprehensive enough, that means that there are things that can kill you on schedule, that we are not slowing down, that we are not repairing, right? And that's why there will be essentially very little impact on longevity, on how long we stay healthy, um, and on how rapidly we go downhill thereafter. Even if we are fixing some of the types of damage, that's not good enough. It's like, you know, it's not good enough with a car to eliminate the rust if you don't eliminate the uh, contaminants in the oil, things like that. Okay, uh, we have um, uh, several more questions in Spanish. Let me read them out to you in English. Uh, Santana is asking, what do you think about the recent uh, discoveries by David Sinclair from Harvard saying that he's rejuvenated minds with injections or different uh, organs in mice with injections. Yeah, so David has been doing some fantastic work over the past, well, of, of course, he's done, he's done fantastic work for the whole of his career. But recently, the work that has been most prominent is to do with using these Yamanaka factors that I spoke about earlier that are used for partial reprogramming. He is particularly fond of using just three of the traditional four, so not using the, the one that is considered to be most dangerous for cancer. Um, and he has been getting very good results. He published a paper a year or two ago now showing that he could uh, help the, with blindness in old mice. 
and he's done more recently. However, there's still a long way to go. Recently, he published a paper showing that you could rejuvenate mice uh, using these techniques, but he used mice that had an acceleration of their aging on account of another thing that he was testing, which he calls the information theory of aging. So we still have some way to go before we can genuinely show that normal mice in middle age can have their lifespan extended using this kind of technique. It's certainly something that needs to be explored and people are exploring it, both David and other people, and we will very much be wanting to explore it as well in combination with other therapies in the future. Um, okay, uh, there is a question from uh, Guillermo Canata. He's asking if we can uh, activate cellular organelles like perosexomas, perosexomas uh, in order to uh, reverse aging. Okay, peroxisomes, which is what you meant, um, are important organelles in all of our cells, but they are not quite so interesting as mitochondria or lysosomes. The reason I say that is because unlike mitochondria, they do not have their own DNA, so they cannot accumulate mutations. And unlike lysosomes, they are not... Um, places for the destruction of, uh, of waste products. So they do not accumulate indigestible waste products. Peroxisomes are more easily regenerated by the cell than either lysosomes or mitochondria. So they do not accumulate damage in the same way. And that's why we are not focusing on them at the moment. But of course, as with everything in biology, more and more is being learnt about peroxisomes all the time, and so we may change our mind, depending on new discoveries. Okay, Bernardo is asking a question in Spanish. Um, it could be interesting to quantify the savings in the um, health systems uh, with life extension. Do you know of any such studies quantifying the economic gains? Oh yes, there have been many such studies quantifying the economic gains. This has been going on for decades, for at least 20 or 30 years, and they have been published by very authoritative people. If you want to know more about this, the right term to search on in Google is longevity dividend. That is the name that has been given to this kind of thing. <coughs> and the numbers are absolutely astronomical. The countries like the USA or Spain would save literally trillions of trillions of dollars per year if they simply postponed the health problems of late life by one or two years. It's just astronomical numbers. So you must ask yourself, um, you know, why are governments so um, uninterested in this? Why are they not putting these, you know, billion, just a, a small amount, like a few billion dollars per year, into research to speed up the development of medicines against aging. And of course, the answer is the usual one. Most policymakers have still got this belief that aging is like gravity and the money spent on medical research will not succeed. We will not get even one year of postponement using this. That is why experiments in laboratories are so important to show that that can't be true that you can take middle-aged animals and keep them healthier for a lot longer just by doing damage repair to them. If we can show that really convincingly in animals, then people will no longer be able to believe that it's impossible in humans. Okay, a student from Mexico is asking, um, um, how much do you know about microbiome companies or research for longevity because he wants to study microbiome. Yeah, so the microbiome is a very important and vibrant area of research. And absolutely, there are companies working on the changes to the microbiome during aging and the potential to influence aging by influencing the microbiome. Uh, probably the most high profile company in that space is called Viome, which starts with a B, it starts with a V, V I O M E. Um, 
uh, run by Naveen Jain, a very wealthy and successful businessman who has become extremely interested in aging over the past several years. So I encourage you to look at what they're doing. Um, at the moment, though, we just don't know. We do not know whether we will be able to make much of a difference to aging by manipulating the microbiome. Certainly there is an interaction between the microbiome, especially in the gut, and the rest of the body, the body may, uh, the human cells. Um, but we do not know whether that interaction is um, meaningfully bidirectional. We do not know whether the whether changing the microbiome in in the gut will have a big beneficial effect. People are very much working on it. Okay, uh, Javier Jimenez is asking in Spanish. Uh, what do you think about NMN or NR? Which do you think is better? Which one, which one would you use? So NMN and NR are both precursors of a very important molecule in the body called NAD. And NAD is something that we cannot take as a supplement because it does not get absorbed by the body but NMN and NR are absorbed and they are converted to NAD. Why would this be useful? Well, the amount of NAD in the body goes down with age. So that seems like it's something that we should be trying to fix. However, there are some questions about this. First of all, we don't really know why the amount of NAD goes down because the body has the capacity to synthesize its own NAD. And so you would think if it needs it, it would be making it. Um, so that's a, that's a question that we really don't know the answer to yet. Secondly, um, we have to ask, you know, why would adding NAD be good? And, w and the main theory for why it's good is that it acts as a CR mimetic, a calorie restriction mimetic, a bit like um, rapamycin, though by a different mechanism. It tricks the body into thinking that it's in a famine and therefore there are changes to gene expressions that result um, from NAD, the same as they would result from calorie restriction itself. Um, and calorie restriction itself and calorie restriction mimetics have a very much smaller effect in long-lived species like humans than what they have in short-lived species like mice. So, um, you know, I, I really don't have all that high hopes for the benefits of NAD precursors. They're definitely better than nothing um, in many ways. Uh, CR and CR mimetics can give some postponement of the health problems of late life, but they are not the holy grail. They are not the fountain of youth. We will re re they don't do damage repair, and what we will really need damage repair in order to get to longevity escape velocity. Okay, I have a question myself. I just finished reading the book Methuselah's Zoo by Steve Oster, who is a leading uh, researcher on longevity. And his argument is that we actually need to study long-lived animals mm -hmm. as opposed to short-lived animals so that we shouldn't uh, worry about mice. We need to worry more about naked mole rats or even more about whales because whales are mammals and they live two centuries. So what is your answer to that argument? Yeah, so Steve is completely right. Steve Orstad is one of the most important researchers in the whole field and has been for decades and decades. And the main reason why he's so important is because before he was a gerontologist, he was a zoologist. So he has much more understanding of the diversity of, of, of nature, of different species, than most gerontologists have. And I'm delighted to say that he will be speaking at my conference this year in Dublin in August the 17th through the 20th. Um, uh, he, he's a splendid speaker, is also a splendid writer, of course. Methuselah's Zoo is a book, a wonderful book written for a general audience. So uh, he will be certainly talking about things like that when he comes to Dublin. Um, but yeah, I mean, the main reason why so little research is done on these interesting species is just because it takes a long time to develop the tools to work on a new species. People can do much more 
rapid experiments if they use species that have been used for many, many years by other researchers. And that's not a good enough reason. So it is extremely valuable that there are a few researchers, like for example, Shelley Buffenstein working on naked mole rats uh, and such like, working on species that live unusually long, given their size, for example. Okay, we have a question from Bernardo, and he, he's saying, what is your experience with <laughs> resveratrol? So resveratrol, of course, was the very first molecule that David Sinclair became famous for, as uh, something that would act as a calorie restriction mimetic. And um, it worked, it, it's supposed to work in large, in somewhat the same way that NAD precursors work, which is, of course, what David moved on to over the years. Uh, but of course, it did not really succeed when taken through into the clinic. Um, various molecules that were similar to resveratrol, but that acted more potently, um, were bought by a big pharma company. And that work did not lead to um, drugs that became clinically available and succeeded in clinical trials. So at this point, we really don't know whether that direction is going to get very far. I think at the moment we can say that certain other drugs that work as calorie restriction mimetics look, are looking more promising, whether it's NAD precursors, whether it's rapamycin, even metformin. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Javier Lopez Diaz, uh, you have your hand up, and then later Mauricio Vladimir. Javier? You are muted. Uh, hola, buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon. Uh, okay. Para una mejor corrección, prefiero si me pueden traducir la pregunta. Eh, bueno, eh, yo quiero preguntarle eh, si es de suponer eh, que se, los acontecimientos se desarrollarán en el orden que voy a decir o podría ser que no necesariamente eh, en ese. Es decir, primero mm, se puede decir que se curarán y podrán prevenir todas las enfermedades. A continuación, tras esto, poder detener, frenar el envejecimiento efectivamente. Eh, posteriormente, eh, la posibilidad de rejuvenecer. Y, y tras ello, pues, años después, poder eh, eh, lograr mm, revivir a todos los criopreservados de una forma efectiva o a una gran parte. Siempre y cuando esa criopreservación pues, se haga con, bueno, con, de una forma eh, íntegra y de, con buena calidad. Okay, Javier, I will try to translate quickly. Uh, he's asking about the timing, the order of uh, the things happening, like if we are going to cure diseases first, if we are going to cure then later aging, and if we are then going to rejuvenate people. And additionally, he talks about cryonics. And then later, after we have cured aging and all of that, we will bring people back uh, from cryonics. So, um, first of all, uh, the, 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 the first part of the question <clears throat> really comes from the same thing I was talking about earlier, that people mean different things by the word aging. Uh, so really, there will not be a difference between the um, treatment of aging and the treatment of age-related diseases. In my mind, there is really no such thing as a distinction between aging itself and the diseases of old age. They are part of the same thing. It's just that there are some aspects of age-related ill health that we give disease-like names to and some that we don't, and that's all. So really, those things will happen at the same time because they are the same thing. Now, reviving people from cryopreservation is, of course, very, very difficult, and there's no point in doing it until we have sufficiently comprehensive rejuvenation technologies that we can repair the thing that they they died of, that they were pronounced legally dead because of. And that will have to be really good, quite apart from the fact that we must also repair any damage that was done by the cryopreservation process. So I think we are still several decades, certainly 30 or 40 years away from being able to revive anybody who was cryopreserved. Um, let me jump in 
there, uh, Aubrey, because oh, um, hey, Ray, Kurzweil, Ray Kurzweil, that we also know very well, he talks about two dates, basically. 2029 for longevity escape velocity that he defines in a similar way, but still aging. We keep on living longer, but aging. And then 2045, when we will be able to rejuvenate people. So that is maybe why some people are confused because he talks about two different processes and two different times. Yeah, I think it's probably uh, confusing to talk about two processes and two times because really there are not going to be two processes and two times. There's going to be one point at which we reach longevity escape velocity. Some people are calling it the Methuselarity and um, there will not be some kind of intermediate time, you know, the intermediate period when we are slowing things down or rejuvenating, but not really rejuvenating, not really re achieving LEV. Okay, Javier, you wanted to say something and then Mauricio? Um, bueno, eh, como conocer un poco de este campo, eh, no sé si me podría eh, decir, a, según tu criterio, cuáles son las compañías criónicas que ofrecen una mejor calidad en cuanto a los procesos de conservación, a un control más riguroso y estricto de, de todos los parámetros que, que hagan pues, tener más esperanzas de cara al futuro. Uh, okay, I will answer that because, Javier, that is the topic of the ne next webinar. On February 12th, we have the three uh, more most interesting cryonics com uh, companies talking about that. So, I want to see you on February 12th and we will have a session only about cryonics, okay? Uh, let's go to the next question, Mauricio. Uh, okay, thank you. I'm going to spread my, my ideas in Spanish and maybe Professor Cordero, Cordero can translate. Uh, me gustaría saber si los esquimales viven en promedio 43 años. Es un producto de las enfermedades que desarrollan y deterioran su cuerpo por eh, el efecto de todas las condiciones extremas que ellos viven. Gracias. Uh, okay, Mauricio is asking about Eskimos. You know the Eskimos in Canada, uh, that he says that they live um, 43 years. And if that is because of uh, their genome, epigenome, environmental conditions, what do you think might be causing that? Well, honestly, I have no idea. I did not actually know that they had such a low life expectancy. Of course, the way to answer this question is to look closely at what they die of, you know, their causes of death, and also at their health during the last 10 years, especially of their lives. So to see whether they are in some way aging differently than other populations. But I do not know. Okay. Um, we have uh, two questions uh, from doctors. Uh, a medical doctor called Dr. Anti Vejez, I believe that is Juan Carlos Mendez uh, from Venezuela. He's asking about uh, mesenchymal stem cells exosomes. Um, what is the latest on that for anti aging effects, uh, mesenchymal stem cells exosomes? Uh, right. So um, we, uh, I actually think there was a similar question earlier on. Um, honestly, you know, it's a very new area. The whole area of exosomes at all is a very new area. There's masses still going on. At the moment, I am not aware of any research showing actual life extension in mice from injecting exosomes of any kind, whether from mesenchymal stem cells or from other sources. But that's probably because the experiments have not yet been done, or at least, or if they are being done, they are not completed yet. So we just don't know yet. It's too early to say. Okay, um, this is also a bit similar to a question before. Uh, Dr. Christian Salas asked about um, autophagy, uh, you know, about uh, fasting and forcing autophagy as a good mechanism. And certainly it is a cheap mechanism for longevity extension. Yeah, so aut autophagy is another word that is often used um, imprecisely. 
So, what, first of all, there are various different types of autophagy, but usually we are referring to something called macro autophagy, which is a process of delivering damaged material from the inside of the cell to the lysosome, which is where things are destroyed in the cell and recycled. Now, autophagy, therefore, consists of two parts, really. The autophagy itself, which is this delivery to the lysosome, and then there is what happens in the lysosome, the destruction of the material that has been delivered. Now, autophagy itself does not decline in terms of its performance during aging, or at least not in any meaningful way. What does decline is the destruction in the lysosome, the second part. So if we stimulate autophagy, what we are doing is we are delivering more stuff to the lysosome. Why would you want to do that? Well, if there is a famine, then there is a need to change priorities in terms of what proteins and other molecules you synthesize in the cell. And that means that it may make sense to destroy some proteins, even when they are not damaged, um, and to recycle them so as to make proteins that you need with higher priority, so to speak, more urgently. So this is a process which is called bulk autophagy, which is distinct from the process of selective autophagy that specifically removes damaged parts of the cell. Um, it certainly, um, you know, it, 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 it happens if you have, if you're in a famine or indeed if the body is being tricked by, for example, rapamycin into thinking it's in a famine, then autophagy is stimulated. Now, is that a good thing? Well, it might have temporary short term advantages, but because it's simply a case of moving material from one place to another, it does not necessarily really affect the accumulation of damage in the cell or in the body. Okay, um, we have another question here about um, aging. Is it um, Bernardo? Bernardo asks, do you think that the aging mechanisms are programmed or caused by the environment? No, neither of those things. Um, the uh, environment has a very limited effect on the rate of aging. Now, when I say this, I mean, of course, I am not talking about extremely bad environments. Certainly, if you live in a situation of very high radiation, for example, or if you have toxins uh, at high levels in your food, then that may accelerate your aging significantly. But if we compare the lifestyle and diet and other environmental factors of people who are not in that situation, then there are very few, there is very small difference between them. Um, <clears throat> now, in terms of whether aging is programmed, it depends what you mean by programmed. Um, certainly, different species have very different lifespans, and that is because they have different genes. They have different genomes. Uh, but within a species, different individuals have very, very similar genomes. And sure enough, they have very, very similar lifespans. And the contribution, what's called the heritability of the, the contribution of genes to lifespan is quite small. So really, the main differences that we see in the population between long lived and short lived individuals come from things that are neither environmental nor genetic. They are really random chance, especially random chance that happens early on in life, very early on in life, before we are born. Um, just small changes in the concentrations of micronutrients can lead to changes in the amount of damage that is accumulated early in life. And that stays with you for the whole of your life. So it looks as though that is probably the major contribution to the variation that we see among people within a population. Um, okay, um, <coughs> we actually have also a reply from Gennady Storialov about Eskimos. We were talking about Eskimos, so Mauricio, 
a, a friend says that various Canadian studies of life expectancy in the 2010s showed that life expectancies of various schemas, Inuit groups, rose to the low 20s. But uh, uh, sorry, sorry, to the low 70 years, but were still lower than the general population. Um, that was kind of an explanation about Eskimos. And we will finish soon. And because we are talking about Eskimos, that means, means cryonics, cryonics. The ne next session is about cryonics. Okay, um, one more question, um, Aubrey, uh, from Dr. Juan Carlos uh, Mendez. Uh, what do you think about hormesis? Hormesis, well, first of all, let me define it for everybody. Um, so hormesis is the concept that we can benefit from mild levels of bad things, mild levels of stress, so long as that stress is temporary. If we have a situation where the body is given some challenge, then the body will mount a response to that challenge and um, minimize the damage that the challenge does. But quite often, that response to the challenge will continue in the body after the stress itself that caused the response has gone away. And that means that the body will be essentially protecting itself unnecessarily well, and that may be beneficial. But as you can see, this effect is going to, it's always going to be very small. Because first of all, the initial stress has to be small in order that it does not kill you or do permanent harm, right? Secondly, the response has to be proportionate to the stress. And even if it continues afterwards, there will be some trade-off because otherwise the elevated response would have existed without having to have the initial stress um, that triggered it. So hormesis is a fact, it exists, but it is a small, has sm only a small effect on health. Okay, I have a final question for you, uh, which is about ethics, the morality of all, all of this, because um, you have argued before that you are dedicating your life uh, to this cause of longevity and anti-aging, because this is the, nor the number one issue for humanity. So could you expand on that? What is, what is the ethical foundation of this uh, war against aging? Yeah, really the only reason why anyone would begin to ask that kind of question is if they are starting from the assumption that aging is something completely different from the diseases of old age. Nobody suggests that there is any ethical question around looking for ways to stop people from getting Alzheimer's disease or looking for ways to stop people from getting cancer. But when we talk about aging, people are much more confused about that. And that's simply because people have a bad idea in their heads of what aging is. That's why I began my talk by describing what aging is and showing that there is no meaningful distinction between the aspects of age-related ill health that we call diseases and the ones that we don't. That's why there is no ethical question here. It's all about health. Ill health causes suffering and we need to minimize, we need to work as humanitarians to minimize the amount of suffering in the world. Aging currently causes far more suffering than any other um, phenomenon in the experience of humanity. So that has to be our number one focus when we want to be humanitarians. Uh, yes, I totally agree, Aubrey. In fact, uh, in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, the first right is the right to life. And it should be the first and the second and the third and the fourth right, because without life, there are no rights. So yes, this is an ethical uh, campaign. I think that you are leading and you have been very successful and we hope you to be more successful in the future. So I recommend everybody to read his fantastic book, Ending Aging in English, or El Fin del Envejecimiento in Spanish or in other languages. And um, besides thanking, um, obviously, Aubrey de Grey and Nicolas for the translation, and Tony 
for the technical assistance. I remember that next uh, event will be on Sunday, February 12th, with three leading experts on cryonics. There were several questions about cryonics, and Aubrey the Grey himself uh, supports cryonics. So do I, personally. So I think um, we need to learn more about this area, about cryonics, and we are going to have fantastic uh, experts talking about that in English with a Spanish translation in the Zoom. Uh, so please register for that too. Looking forward to having you with us forever and ever and ever. And if we live long enough, Aubrey will have time to learn Spanish. <laughs> and we will have time to learn uh, Klingon or Vulcan. Because I love to say, you know, like uh, Mr. Spock, live long and prosper. But I want to say it in Vulcan and in Klingon in many other languages. So, so Aubrey, any, any final words uh, to say goodbye until we see you next time? Well, I just want to thank you, Jose and Nicholas and Tony and everyone who was involved in having me along today and all the excellent questions from the audience. Thank you very much for your interest in this work and let us move on together and bring aging under complete medical control as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Live long and prosper, my friends. Bye for now. Bye. Cheers.